Welcome everyone and what a privilege it is again to be with you today, wherever you're listening to this. Um, today's message actually links a bit into last week um, on Evan Oberholz's message on friendship with God. And um, in this preparation of this message, I just really felt that there's something that God wants to take us deeper into knowing who He is and understanding how our relationship with Him can be woven into every aspect of our lives. Um, Evan alluded to, he looked at Job, this this larger than life character. And oftentimes when we when we think of friends with God, we, we, these are the kind of people we have in mind. We have an Abraham and a Moses and Noah, and uh, you know, we've got these great leaders, these stable men of faith um, that had these great relationships with God. So that then kind of led me to ask the question is, can ordinary people like me and you, can we be friends with God? Now, maybe the automatic answer is, yes, yes, of course we can. Okay. Um, why do you say so? You know, if you say, no, no, it was only meant for certain people and for certain, even today, only certain people are closer to God and the rest of us kind of, we operate on the fringes. I say, okay, um, but then why do you say so? And, and that's what I'm trusting that in our time here today on this message, through this message, we get to answer this. Can we experience a relationship that is so close that we can actually call God friend? By doing that, we're going to look at three things. We're going to look at a promise that we find in Scripture. We're going to look at a problem that we currently face. And then what solution do we have so that we can actually attempt to answer this question? And can you and I live closely with our Creator? Lord, I want to pray that you bless this time together. May we receive what you want us to receive from this word. I pray may it challenge us and convict us and encourage us to pursue you with everything in us. In Jesus' name, amen. So if we think of friendship, friendship is this, this interesting relationship we have because it's um, normally the friends you have in your life is because you've chosen them. And that's what makes this unique. It's not family that they're there no matter what. Friendship and having friends is, is there's actually a willful decision you and I have to make to allow this person into our space. Now, a great example of this is the hit series called Friends. Now, this is such a famous series that even... 20 years, 20 years after it's finished, it is still one of the most watched sitcoms that we find on Netflix today. Why? Because when we look at the relationship and we look at the lives of Joey, Monica, Rachel, Phoebe, Ross and Chandler, when we look at this relationship, there's a desire in us and say, and that looks great. I wish I was part of that. I, I, how great would it have been to be part of this group? There's a desire in us that wants that. Now, maybe if friends is something foreign to you, you don't know what it is, maybe this next picture of these two men will show, will maybe trigger a few things. Yes, Sia Kulisi and Eben Etzebet. Now, if you look at this photo, I want you, you should, don't find someone who looks at you the way Eben looks at Sia. I mean, imagine that. What I love about this Saturday after the rugby game, um, how Sia took a break of just being the Springbok captain and this national hero and just took time to honor his friend for his achievement and he just shared something so beautiful. And we look at this and say, oh man, that is so moving because there's something unique in that relationship between Sia and Yebin that if we're all honest, we really want as well. Now, what about the next category of people? If um, what happens if I put on Adam and Eve and God? Genesis 3 verse 8 says, And they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This relationship between Adam and Eve and God in, 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 in Eden and in, and in the initial idea with what God had with creation, they were so intimate that Adam and Eve could recognize God by the way, by the sound of his footsteps. The scripture says they heard the sound of the Lord God walking. Imagine how close you have to be with someone that if they're approaching, you know exactly what it is just by the way they walk. I mean, how intimate and close was that relationship? Imagine at the end of the day for your afternoon cup, cup of coffee or tea, you have God actually pitching up there and saying, hey, fat white for me too, please. This is the closeness that we see Adam and Eve had with God. Now, the moment they left the garden because of sin, not only was this closeness lost for them, but it was pretty much lost for the rest of us. 
that closeness, intimate relationship with God was lost for the rest of humanity. But what I find interesting, if you read just a bit further in the Old Testament, you get to the book of Leviticus. Now, Leviticus 26 verse 12 says the following. It says, And I will walk among you. I will be your God, and you shall be my people. Now, what's important for us to understand in the Hebrew expression of walking actually meant intimate friendship. So whenever you read the Bible and you see they were walking together, or God walked with this person, or these people were walking together, it was a... In almost like modern day Christianity, we say things like, have you ever heard of the expression, let's do life together or let's go on a journey together. Now, what does that mean? It means a deep, intimate friendship relationship. Now, the Hebrew metaphor used for friendship was walking. So here we find a promise in the Old Testament, even in the midst of the fall and sin and the brokenness in the world, we see a promise that says, I will walk among you. I will be a God and you will be my people. This is the promise that we receive from God, a promise of friendship, a promise of intimacy, and a promise of closeness from God. And we have to recognize this today, that this promise is for us. And we should celebrate that. Thank God that he, now yet again, walking with God, having having, being a friend with God means he chooses you, friends. He doesn't just, you're not just part of the package. No, I will walk with you. I will choose you. Now, that is the promise. We've got a bit of a problem. What do you mean by that? If friendship or closeness and intimacy with God is promised, why do so few humans experience it today? Why do so many of us suffer from lack of intimacy, lack of presence, and lack of knowing God? Because the promise is there. The problem is... And we see it that often. Problem is, why don't I see that that often? Now, to answer this, I want us to look at a familiar character in the Bible named Enoch. Now, you might have heard of him or not. I'm going to explain to you exactly who this man was. But we're not only going to look at the man Enoch. We're going to look at the first city ever, well, probably this disputable, I guess. But one of the first cities ever created was the city of Enoch. So we find two Enochs in the Bible. We find the man Enoch and we find the city of Enoch. And we're going to kind of wrestle through this to get to the answer. Why do we struggle? Why is this problem still in our lives even though the promise of friendship exists? Now let's pick this up in Genesis 4. Adam and Eve have sinned. They've been cast out of the garden and they have two sons. So they have Cain and Abel. Now Cain was the firstborn, Abel was the second one. And most of you know the story from, I guess, kindergarten or um, Bible school or college or whatever, um, or nursery rhymes. Um, Cain and Abel, uh, Cain is this firstborn son, and a lot is made of in Jewish traditions about the firstborn son. Like, he's the family hope. He's uh, all the inheritance goes to him, the blast, the halt, alles is going to to Cain. And, um, well, that's how the system was set up. But God did something interesting. He didn't necessarily pour his favor out on Cain, but he chose Abel. Now, this is a bit strange and and contradicting the natural rules of Jewish tradition. But the reason for this is because when it was time to give sacrifices to God, Abel would give the best of his best of his best because God deserves only the best. And Cain, well, he'd give up a mini or a mango or some fruit or some vegetables where his brother Abel would sacrifice his best lamb and his best animal, Cain would just give what kind of had on the day. So God decides he will, he chooses Abel. And this makes Cain very angry and he eventually commits murder and he kills his brother. Um, Genesis 4 verse 10 says the following, And the Lord said to Cain, What have you done The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than what I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and away from your face. And your face shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. 
So pretty much what Cain, this conversation was in Cain and God. God is actually saying to Cain, nothing you'd ever do for the rest of your life, nothing you'd ever do for the rest of your life will ever bring you full satisfaction. You will wander around, you will be restless, you will struggle to find purpose and satisfaction with everything you do because my presence will no longer be with you. And when Cain hears that, he actually responds in a profound way. He says, this punishment is greater than I can bear. Why? Because Cain knew what it felt like to experience the presence of God. God had still been present in their lives, in his life. And, and realizing the loss that this is going to occur actually says, this is too much what I can bear. Church, and this is still applicable to us today, that nothing, nothing, nothing can satisfy us the way that the presence of God can bring satisfaction to us. No person, no job, no hobby, no sport, no hype, no moment of euphoria, nothing can bring you satisfaction in the presence of God. About a year ago, the Springboks won the Rugby World Cup, and that was a great moment. We all rejoiced, and we lived with that euphoria maybe for a few days and stretching it for a few weeks. I've got a few friends that maybe it went into a month, but today you did not wake up and say, man, we are the world champions. It doesn't take away the truth, but that doesn't satisfy now. The result of not experiencing the presence of God, the result of not knowing God intimately, results in us wandering around and restless and looking for satisfaction wherever we go. See, when we're not satisfied in God, when we are not in His presence, and that doesn't bring us satisfaction, we will turn to everything else in search of satisfaction and purpose. It's to be restless and a wanderer for the rest of your life. Always hoping that this relationship, that this call, that this business deal, that this breakthrough, that this whatever, this meal plan, this CrossFit subscription, this will bring me the satisfaction and it doesn't and you keep searching. People move away from God in search of the something new. They try to be everywhere but ultimately end up nowhere. We move from relationship to relationship job to job, city to city. If I didn't try golf, it was cycling. Not cycling, it's CrossFit. Not CrossFit, it's hunting. It was a hunting, it's like a fey pottery barn. I don't know what you call that. And then they make those shapes of things. But we bounce around looking for something that was full this need. And this was the curse that fell on Cain, that the presence of God will never be with him again. So it's interesting. So Cain gets this sanctioned from God because of what he did. So God deals with the, mis- with, the, with the injustice and the evil that he did, and he deals with him. And what's interesting is what Cain does next. In verse 16 to 18, he says, those, uh, Genesis 4 says, Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after his son Enoch. So here we see Cain realizes this is his, his, his curse that he's not working under. He's left the presence of God. And what does he do? He goes and builds something. And he names him Enoch. And the city of Enoch is born. Exciting times for planet Earth. Because a few thousand years ago, there was a lot of um, metallurgical um, substance everywhere. So the birthplace of brass and iron and metal kind of just st- started pouring forth from the city. So we see um, some historians track back the first instances of brass instruments, of metal um, engineering devices that came from this time because of the abundance of iron. Um, so here we find leisure and entertainment and business and opportunity started to grow from out the city of Enoch. Busyness of the city was actually revealing something of Cain's desire and his hope. Out of the presence of God, you and I will wander for the rest of our lives looking for something to fulfill us. So we end up building things, starting things, creating things. In need for what? To bring fulfillment. 
So this whole basis on what this city was started was trying to substitute the presence of God with something else so that we can find satisfaction. And doesn't that sound familiar? This was the start of the pursuit for humanity to be satisfied, to live in a, a society where we can find satisfaction apart from God. This is the start of it. This is the start of a people who thought by adding stuff into their lives, they could satisfy, it could satisfy us by creating things and having enough things that we don't really need God. But if history has proven us, well, shown us very clearly, if celebrities and actors and prolific people have shown us, if history has just shown us, that even the most beautiful stuff, even the most successful companies, even being the most famous person in the world still comes short to find the place where we're at peace and fully satisfied. So in essence, what the city of Enoch represented was that we can live lives trying to fulfill the desire in our heart that was only meant for God. And that is something we still find today. What it also shows is that if you and I live a life with no presence of God, no fulfillment from God. We will, we will do whatever we can. We'll, we'll die trying to find something to, to do that. I was this week, I saw something that I found absolutely ridiculous. Have you ever heard of the thing called hobby horsing? Now, I'm going to explain this to you. All. You can see the photo what it is. So it's literally people that take a broomstick and they put like a fake horse head on the end of the broomstick. And then they participate in equestrian sports like show jumping and dressage. So it's people on a wooden broom doing things that horses should be doing. And this has now become a thing. There's a world championship in Germany that took place. So I'm like thinking we literally will push the, the limit to try and find a fall and that we will have that people are riding wooden sticks and pretending it's horses. I mean, how far have we gone in? It's the most ridiculous thing ever. You should, you can go on YouTube. This right after this sermon, it's on YouTube. I'll, I'll be awesome. I was like, is that how far we've come? That, oh, if you're a hobby horse, I don't hope I don't offend you. And, you know, I, God bless and grow the sport as much as you can. But just to thinking, we, 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 we've made stuff. It's this consistent need to find something to bring purpose and satisfaction into my life. What we also see coming from the city of Enoch, um, which a lot of historians refer to as the original sin city. We find murder, revenge, pride. We find stuff like poly polygamy for the first time coming out in society. Now, it's interesting. People oftentimes say, yeah, but look, the Bible endorses polygamy. Look at all these people that have many wives. No, if you very clearly see God's intention for marriage and humanity was one man, one woman, Adam and Eve. There we go. Now, because of sin and turning away God's design, what do people do when we are consistently looking to fulfill and satisfy our needs that cannot be filled and satisfied with anything from this world? Now, extra partners were added into intimate relationships. God's intention was for one man and one woman, and in the city, the foundation where we cannot be satisfied. That's why people just started adding multiple relationships. So God didn't start this. A self-satisfaction-seeking society did. I'm going to say that again. So God didn't start something like polygamy. A self-satisfaction-seeking society did. Because they thought by having more sexual partners, we would be more satisfied and fulfilled. This is the lie the world even believes today that we can be satisfied outside of God and we can be happy without the presence of God. Now, as you, I'm, I'm laboring on this because I really believe this is the foundation. If you and I want to live in intimacy and in closeness and in a close proximity, a friendship relationship with God, we need to get this, that no, and that having the right spouse having the right job, having the perfect house, having the great business, having the, the right thing to drink in the right time, having enough money that cannot, cannot do what only God can do in our lives. There's nothing wrong with a good job. 
for a beautiful wife and a beautiful husband and the dream home and there's nothing wrong with us. But when they become the primary source of where we find purpose and satisfaction, we will find ourselves in a very dangerous position. And that's where our lives sometimes, we find ourselves in life. Outside of the presence of God, when we don't, when we've turned our back towards Him, when we don't experience the presence of God, we will go and we will build things. We will start things and we will create things because we want satisfaction. We want purpose. But there's alternative to this. You see, when we are in the presence of God, it still leads us to build things and create things and start things. But now no more to bring satisfaction into our souls. Now the purpose of the build and the create and the start is not self-satisfaction, but it's God glorification. That's the alternative. So we have a choice. There is an alternative. When we build our lives in the presence of God, that will still lead you to dream and create and be and be the best you can be. But the purpose for that then becomes to glorify God, not to fill the need inside. So my question to you today is what are you building and why are you building it? This current life that you're busy building, why are you building it? That business that you want to pursue, why are you pursuing it? That social media page that you're building up to become this person of influence, why are you doing it? Because if the answer is to bring fulfillment and satisfaction, probably means that, probably means that we are missing the presence of God in our lives. Because when we know Him intimately, when we walk with Him, that building grant will be solely to bring Him glory. So why are you building what you're building? This is where I want to introduce you to the man called Enoch. So we looked at the city, and now we're looking at the man. Now this man, we don't know much about him, but there's one massive characteristic that we knew. In Genesis 5, verse 22, it says, Enoch walked with God. So walk, then we find the walking concept. So Enoch, close, intimate friendship, relationship with God. Walked with God after he fathered with Methuselah 300 years. And he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. I love the, I love the way that the ESV just says it. It says, and he was not. Now, what does that mean? It means he disappeared. Like God was so, the relationship was so close. They had such a good connection. They were so close that, that God said, you know, I can't even wait for you today. Come, today, there you go. And he, well... I guess a modern word for it. And he was teleported out of the existence of earth. God took him away. Because the pleasure in that relationship, I don't know, was maybe so great that God said, I can't wait another day. I need, come with me. I need you full time with me. How beautiful is that? But here we see, here's a man who walked with God, who was known for walking with God, who walked with God for 300 years. And then he was. city of Enoch, designed to fill our lives in search of purpose and fulfillment, but ultimately leading to just the evil cycle of searching and not finding and searching and not finding. And this man of Enoch, here we see a man that walked with God, that the pleasure was so mutual that God said, I cannot wait, it is time that you come. Find this contrast between the city and the man very clearly. Hebrews 11 says the following about Enoch. Now, this is the only other part that we really know. It says, by faith, Enoch was taken up so he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. See, so we see he was a man of faith because we know that the word says we cannot please God if we don't deliver by faith. But here we see, here was a man that God had pleasure with, a man that walked with faith, a man that was close with him, so much so that God said, I cannot wait. Come. But this still doesn't answer our question, right? It still doesn't speak into the problem. It's given us two options and it's given us alternatives. But how does this speak into 
okay, if this is possible, if I can have this relationship with Enoch and I, and I see it as a promise in Leviticus and I see this in this man that modeled something that I should and I want to pursue that, I, will, I desire that, but, but why don't we see this in our lives? Why, why do so few of us experience this relationship or friendship with God? I believe it's because of the following. It's either, either we live in Enoch or we live like Enoch. Either we live in the city of Enoch, where it's this, where ultimately the foundational belief is that I can find fulfillment and satisfaction in anything except God. We're living like Enoch is that the expression of that my existence is solely interwoven with the existence of who God is and seeing his presence in my life and finding fulfillment and purpose in that. So either you and I live in Enoch or live like Enoch. Which Enoch do you represent today? If you have to honestly look at your own life and put up the mirror and say, all right, inspection time, do you find yourself just consistently on the search of significance, of purpose, but deep down there's a restlessness and a wondering where I wonder which relationship will, will, will finally do it. I wonder which job, which car, which house, which city. Well, I wonder which one will eventually make me go at ease. Which Enoch do you resonate with today? Either we live in a way, either we live in a way where we, where we believe we can find satisfaction in everything around us, or we live in a way where we know that our satisfaction and purpose can only come from God. And this, I believe, is foundational for us to really start and, and see a, real, a friendship bloom with God is answering that question. How do we do this? If that's what we want, I want to live like it. I want to be satisfied and I want purpose di directly re dipped in the presence of God. How do I do this? Ways? Well, I believe the solution starts with the following. It says... The solution to this problem starts with understanding that ultimately we can't get there by ourselves. We needed someone to do this on our behalf for us. We need to understand that because Jesus is who he is and because of what Jesus did, what he did, he has made it possible for us to access this kind of relationship. He is the one that fulfilled the promise in Leviticus 26 verse 12 that made it possible for God to say, I will walk with you because Jesus came to walk with us. And think about it, church. Who, who else knew of that promise of intimacy with God more than him? Who fulfilled the promise so that all of us may have and partake in this relationship? Who was persistent even until death in walking with God? Who was pleased, who had pleased God so much so that, he, that God said, because of you, I will pour out my love and spirit to everyone who calls on your name. Who became our blood sacrifice to find God's favor so that we can call on the name of the Lord. His name is Jesus. You see, what Jesus came to do, he restored. He restored or reversed that what Cain did. Cain killed an innocent man and poured out of his blood to find satisfaction. Jesus says, I will spill my own blood. And if you accept that, you will find satisfaction and significance. What Cain broke down, Jesus has made possible again. Because of the acts of Cain that ultimately solidified the pushing away of the presence of God, Jesus said, I'm going to make it possible again not by killing another, but by laying my life down so that you can enter into this. So can an ordinary person like me or like you be friends with God? And I don't mean it in a great idea kind of way. I really mean a friend of God. Someone that you can share your heart with, your desires with, your disappointments with. Someone who will always be ready to listen. And if you give him a chance, he will speak back. Someone who's available, whether it's 9 o'clock at night, 2 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock in the morning, he's available. I'm talking about a friend who knows your name and you know his. Can we? Ephesians 2 verse 18 says, For through him, the him he has referred to in Jesus, 
For through Jesus, we have access in one spirit to the Father. Now, if we have access again to the Father, friends, we can have a close, intimate friendship relationship with Him. But it's a choice. Just like any other friend in your life, you choose whether you want to spend time, invite them over, organize something, share with them what you want to share. It's the same as a choice. I hope today that you can see God's making the choice for you. He said, I want you as my friend. Can we make that choice back? And how do we do this? How do we make that choice? I'm going to teach you three things. Number one, walk in his presence. The presence of God is addictive. And when you and I are touched by him, nothing comes close to that. Now, I don't mean getting like fill your life with church stuff, all right, or church activities or church events that's not what i'm saying now i'm not saying those things are great i love spending time with church and being around people and, and doing what god's called us to do but i'm talking about finding yourself in spaces where i'm motivated by the only the only motivation why i'm engaging right now is because i adore and love you jesus is finding ourselves in places where no one's going to say good job no one's going to encourage you but that you are living based on the conviction that i love jesus and what his presence means to me and i regularly return to that and not, and not necessarily only attending things because we have to, because it's the right thing to do, or because my friends are doing that. Because the problem is when, when we only move, I think the biggest danger that we can face is getting caught up in a performance, output-driven relationship with God. It's about that breakthrough with this need or that desire. But there's always something that needs to happen. There's always something. Imagine meeting a friend for breakfast and you spend time with them every week and you have a breakfast every week, but secretly you hope every single time, oh, I, hope they pay the, I hope they pay the bill this week. Can you imagine what a friendship or a relationship would look like if we always had this, there must be an output. Do I think Jesus, no, he's a miracle working God and and he does incredible things. And ultimately, if we follow him and love him and, and welcome him in our lives, we will see things change. But I think he also offers something so much deeper and rewarding to our souls, and that is himself and his presence and his whisper and his touch and his laugh and his cry. To know him, to pursue him and seek him for him. I think it's, it's one of those difficult things to do. But I believe that it's one of the most important calls in the ownership answer. It's not so that something can happen. This is something that I've had to relearn myself, even being in ministry for such a long time. Can I just come to him because we're friends and we enjoy spending time together? We were in the Kruger National Park recently and the moment I drive through that gate, the pleasure of being there is so overwhelming. I don't have to really see an animal. And yes, there's excitement and you want to see great things, but just being in there and and it's such this this so much pleasure. Even if nothing really happens. Can that be our relationship with Jesus? That it's it's just so pleasurable. It's so unique and beautiful. That if it's that, then it's that. So number one, walk in his presence. If you want to choose this friendship, I want to ask you to walk in his presence. We can't do it out of it. You can fill your life with church activities and still not be in his presence. Seek his presence. Number two, walk in persistence. I love what Enoch, the man, modeled to us. He says he walked with God for 300 years. Now that is a long-term commitment. Now, maybe in a generation of millennials and Gen Zs, we, you know, commitment, hey, that's a tough thing to talk about. I'm not going to jump into that there. But what a long-term commitment. Like 300 years, God, you and me, friends. Now, I don't know about you, but how many, how many offenses are you away from, okay, I'm leaving the WhatsApp group. We've had enough. How long, how long, how long do you stay around? We've said, I'm out of here. How many disappointments are you away from abandoning God? One. Two, three, ten. There's something in walking with persistence, that walking through all seasons of life, walk, walking through the valleys, being on top of the mountain, 
where we just continually walk with him because friendship with God or the being friends with God isn't only meant to be all right I'm in trouble could you come fetch me my friend no one wants friends like that imagine you you had people that only were there are in trouble they would contact you that's not a rich friendship there's something that he modeled where he's just this is a dedicated life of togetherness that lasted in his terms 300 years now you and I will probably not get that old one day but I'll in it Jesus, that your presence is so fulfilling, I'm in it. Even if it means my life doesn't turn out to what I kind of hoped it should, I'm in it. Walk in his presence. Walk in persistence. No matter what, no matter how tough it gets, keep walking with him. And number three, walk in his pleasure. Enoch pleased God. And that to me just summarizes this this relationship as being joyful and apart from, yes, purposeful, but joyful and something to be enjoyed. Friends, a relationship with Jesus is more than just a logistical thing that we put in our lives so that we can live better lives. It's more than just following certain rules and doing certain things so that we can tick certain boxes. There's an enjoyment to this. There's a, a pleasure that God wants to share with us in our relationship with him. And last thing he just said, I just enjoyed my time with Jesus today. No matter what that looks like. When last you've been in church at a service and you walked out and said, I just enjoyed being with him today. I enjoyed being with people that also enjoyed being with him. Because there wasn't something to do on the other side of that meeting. There wasn't something to change on the other side of that meeting. It was just the delight of your company. And we do this by living by faith. So how do we choose? We walk in His presence, we walk in persistence, and we walk in His pleasure. So you and I can be friends with God in a real, intimate way. Because He's promised it. There's a solution to the problem. And you and I just are determined, are we either living in Enoch or are we living Lord, I pray that as this, as this, as my words and as your scripture just come fall in our hearts today. And some of us might be asking some hard questions. Um, I pray um, for your grace to face them, for the ability to be honest with ourselves and with the people around us, and even with you, God. Lord, you didn't just come to keep us busy. You didn't just come so that we can operate in church programs or do good things for people. You came and you promised us a relationship that is refreshing to the soul, spirit, mind, and body. That is something that is to be enjoyed. And I pray for someone, Lord, on the other side of this camera today, Lord, that is seeking that, that is seeking that fulfillment, that is seeking that satisfaction, that only your presence can be about. I pray that your presence supernaturally move into their lives. But Lord, I also pray that we will become hungry for it, that we will go and look for it, that we will seek for it, or we will die trying. Lord, and maybe there's a moment where today we can say sorry that we are, that because we are not in your presence, we end up building things and starting things to satisfy a desire in our hearts. I pray that you'll show us what exactly we are building and why we are building it, so that we can bring it back to you and say, Lord, from your presence, help me build. Thank you that you promise friendship. Thank you that you promise intimacy with us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. If this has impacted you and, and you want to get in contact with us, please send us a message. You'll see the link at the bottom of the of the video. Um, the great thing is we get to do this together. And my hope is that if you desire his presence in your life, that you will do what's necessary that you won't be prideful and say but i'll figure out by myself no let's learn and grow together and pursue him with everything we have see you guys next time